Good morning, everybody. This is Jeff K. Brown, China Rising Radio Sign of Land in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And I am so happy to have on the show today, Ellen Brown. How are you doing? Good. How about you? Yeah, she's in, uh, uh, in California, and I am truly honored to have her on the show today and would like to thank uh, Patri Patrice Granville, editor-in-chief of the Greenville Post, for putting us in touch. Let me tell you a little bit about Ellen, um, uh, a, a very amazing uh, woman. Uh, she is an attorney, chair of the Public Banking Institute, which will be the focus of our uh, uh, interview today, and I hope, you know, we'll get, entice you all to, to get involved. And author of 13 books, including Web of Debt, The Public Bank Solution, Banking on the People, Democratizing Money in the Digital Age. She also hosts a radio program on prn.fm called It's Our Money. Her 300 plus blog articles are posted at ellenbrown.com. And I personally signed up for Ellen's email newsletter to follow P and well, from now on, if I say PBI, I mean Public Banking Institute, to follow PBI's work, you should to buy and share her books or ask your local library, school, university, place of worship, or book club to buy them for everybody's benefit. And I tell you what, the reason I wanted to ask Ellen on the show is living and working in China for 16 years, I have seen the success of a country where there are no private banks. And, and, and I, I feel it's this important to save humanity. The West needs to develop public banking for the benefit of the 99%. If you go to the if you go to the blog uh, to the uh, interview page, I have everything: her email, websites, where you can buy her books, all of her social media. So glad to have you on the show today, uh, Ellen. Thank you for coming. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Great to be talking to you. Ellen, please tell us about yourself and how you got involved in the public banking movement. Uh, well, I guess it could be said that I started the public banking movement. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I wrote a Web of Debt, my first book on this subject. I had written 10 books on health and the politics of health, and one thing led to another. Anyways, Anyway, I wound up in writing about um, banking and the Federal Reserve and the fact that banks, not the government, creates most of our money supply. And it, so Web of Debt was pretty much a history of, of banking, particularly in the United States. Um, and so I wrote that was published in 2007 and then in 2000 so and then I was writing articles and in 2008 after the crisis uh -huh. I uh, knew that North Dakota was the only state that had its own bank so I was watching it and it turned out it was the only state that escaped the credit crisis <laughs> <laughs> what a coincidence <laughs> it had, the, had the lowest unemployment rate in the country the lowest default rate the lowest foreclosure rate the most <laughs> banks per capita didn't lose any banks in the crisis and you you no doubt know that China also <laughs> escaped the credit crisis oh, yeah, and yeah. all those countries that had strong public banking sectors at least at first you know now that everybody's been dragged down by things since but anyway so so I started writing about it the Bank of North Dakota and that generated quite a bit of interest and so we formed a Google group and went round and round on the issues for a couple of years. And then we decided it was, we'd done enough talking, it was time to get out there and do something. Okay. So we formed the Public Banking Institute in 2011. Oh, wow, okay. And, and that same year, California um, had a bill put on by a legislator in uh, San Diego for um, a feasibility for a state, a feasibility study for a state owned bank. And, um, it passed both houses of the legislature, but Jerry Brown didn't sign it. Uh, but we, well, you know, right right off the bat, that we thought we were on a roll, but then you know how they go. Then we uh, you get all the pushback from the big banks and from uh, various sources. So so now we've been at it for eight years, I guess nine years, and uh, and we've gotten older and wiser. And just this last, or just. Uh, let's see, on September 2nd, uh, Gavin Newsom signed AB 857, which is a bill to carve out a special uh, charter for, uh, for a municipal publicly owned bank in California. So that's our big win of this this, this year, 2019. Congratulations. 
Yeah, thanks. It's, uh, I mean, we still, it still just sets out the requirements. We still don't have a bank. But anyway, we're, we're making quite a bit of progress. We've got um, over 25 bills, active bills being pursued in different places across the country. In New Jersey, uh, the governor of New Jersey, uh, Phil Murphy, just signed an executive order a couple of weeks ago for, um, to, uh, for uh, let's see, for a task force to look into forming a state-owned bank, okay. he ran yeah. on a public bank, state bank platform. I mean, that was one of many promises when he actually won. And uh, I saw somewhere in an article it said he he'd done all of them except the state bank. So I think <laughs> legislative or this executive order to get moving on it. So anyway, we have lots of activities. We, but. Um, and to me, the most most uh, gratifying thing is that millennials have gotten behind it. So now we have right. this this grassroots support, which is great because we're getting old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No kidding. Well, you know, when I grew up in Oklahoma, we always used to say, "How do you eat an elephant?" And the answer is one bite at a time. So uh, <laughs> I know that's what you're, you're eating a very, very big ele elephant. Well, listen, private banks have been around for a long time. You know, Jesus Christ was killed at the request of temple bankers for threatening their business. Private bankers have a millennial history of fomenting wars to loan to, bankrupting countries, and destroying entire peoples. That's the bad news. But going back in history, have there ever been examples of people-owned public banks? Yes, it's been um, public banks versus private banks, all the way going back to ancient Samaria. So you could oh, go wow. back 500 yeah. years. Um, um, contrary to popular belief, banking did not evolve like in classical times from barter and then, you know, it became more sophisticated with gold, etc. It actually goes all the way back to the Sumerians who, who knows where they came from, but they were the, they had the first written language, the first agriculture, the first, you know, they genetically manipulated seeds, they had domesticated animals, they built those amazing structures that nobody knows how they managed to move those stone blocks or, you know, get them in place where they're, you can't even slip, slip a piece of paper between them. Mm -hmm. So they did amazing things and they had a huge workforce and you can see it on their carvings, you know, all these workers and of course they would have to to, to do all the things they did. So to organize them, they had this system that was, there was no money in the sense of, you know, round gold coins. It was all, um, uh, it was all written. So it was all mm -hmm. basically receipts or contracts. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are thousands of these um, cuneiform writings, the tablets with cuneiform writings on them. And most of them are not what you would expect. They're not like letters or histories or something like that. They're mostly contracts or mm -hmm. economic, you know, just keeping records of who owes what to whom. And it, it started out with the little figures. At first, they did these cylinders where they actually put little sort of toys in it, you know, little tokens that represented different things like cows and corn or whatever. And then they, on the outside, to show what was in the, in the tube, they made these little symbols. And then the symbols became, you know, st standalone things where they didn't use the tubes anymore. They just used the symbols for corn and wheat or whatever. Um, so... The, uh, Michael Hudson has written extensively about this. He's an economist who's, uh, you know, also... Yeah, he's he's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, and, he's really wonderful. Uh, David Graeber, uh, his book, uh, Debt, uh, The First 5,000 Years, uh, is also really good. And he talked a lot about how most debt throughout history has been social. You know, it's just been social and, 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 and as you said, re reciprocal uh, and, and not based on interest, et cetera. So, uh, so, we do have, so we do have a track record of, of, of public uh, people-owned banking uh, going back 5,000 years. And in the U.S., or what was the, before we were the U.S., our first banking, our first banks were public banks. We didn't have you didn't have private banks on every corner. The Bank of England wasn't really here. They were in competition, but, but you know, it's not like you had you could go to your Bank of England and make a deposit. So in Pennsylvania, Benjamin Franklin's colony, not much was happening. There wasn't 
because there was no money to trade with. They didn't have silver and gold to speak of. I mean, they have more silver than gold, but they didn't have much. And so um, they could, first the colonists got the idea of issuing little paper receipts that were, that was first the governor of um, Massachusetts had to fight a little war, border war, and he didn't have money to pay for it. So he got the idea of he would just issue these little receipts to the soldiers that would be like advances against future taxes. But the problem was that it was a lot easier to issue the receipts than to, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, then to pay a hat, so you go. <laughs> you're dealing with like frontiersmen or, you know, people you can't nail down real well. And, uh, and they, they were kind of opposed to the whole idea of government, of course. So, um, so it did tend to inflate the system. There tended to be too many notes out there, but in Pennsylvania, they got the idea of, um, having a bank. It was called a land bank. So that the colony printed the money, the local, the provincial government printed the money, and then they would lend it to the farmers at 5% interest. And, and they could print a little extra, you know, to make sure you had enough to cover principal and interest. So you didn't have this continual debt pyramid like we have uh, now. Yeah. Where the whole thing tips over and then you got to start again. So there was enough money out there to pay principal and interest. So it was a very sustainable system. Uh, and that worked up until King George decided <laughs> to, to forbid, forbid the colonies to issue their own money. I mean, uh, okay. Yeah. And Benjamin, there you go. Benjamin, go ahead. Benjamin Franklin made the mistake of going to England and uh, talking to, uh, I guess he's talking to the king, but uh, with the Bank of England in the king's ear and uh, saying, oh, this, you know, we really need to be able to issue our own money. This is how, why we're flourishing. We don't need to borrow, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that did not go over real well with the Bank of England because the goal of having colonies was not for them to be self-sufficient. The goal was to have, uh, mm -hmm. to be able to colonize them, to be able to exploit their commodities, get commodities cheaply and so forth. So, so the king cut off all the colonies from issuing their own money and then that caused a big depression and then that got the farmers up in arms and so um that was supposedly a major trigger of the american revolution wow so then i mean there's a long history and i wrote all that up of course in my numerous books but all I, right I, cool well, listen, you brought up a very good point. The Central Bank of England was created in 1694 to print money to lend to the king who needed to fight French King Louis XIV. Privately owned central banks have been creating money and lending it to governments ever since. And Baron Nathan Mayer Rothschild famously said, I care not what puppet is placed on the throne of England to rule the empire. The man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British empire, and I control the money supply. All of this is nuts. Please tell us about how private banks insinuate themselves into the economic and governmental system and take it over. Okay, so you had these two competing systems. The private system that was that issued paper money. So you had, when, when the printing press came along, uh, the goldsmiths discovered that they could give out little paper receipts for people's gold, that people would rather leave the gold with the goldsmiths than, um, and, and trade in the receipts than carry the gold because it wasn't safe and it was heavy and all that stuff. So, so the goldsmiths figured out that they could lend 10 times as many notes as they had gold because <laughs> fractal loan lending. Yeah, yeah. Because people only came for the gold 10% of the time on average. So, so that was what the bank of England were doing. I mean, they, they were lenders and they supposedly backed these paper notes with gold, but they were issuing many more notes than they had gold and they, and the King borrowed them and the King didn't have to pay them back. That was the deal. All he had to do was pay the interest year after year after year. And that's exactly what we still have. We never ever pay off the federal debt. If you look at a chart, if we had never had to pay interest, you could make a case that we wouldn't have any federal debt because what keeps growing is the interest, which goes yeah. up and, and that's what, you know, we have to pay the interest year after year. Um, so, 
Anyway, that I lost my train of thought. Well, that's okay. Uh, no, but yeah, you're just you, they, yeah. They, so that, that fractal, was the, fra fractal lending and 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 you know paying all that in billions and billions and billions of dollars of interest every year, and it just keeps going up and up and up. It's nuts. And in the 19th century, then you again you had a battle between public and private, um, where the private bank well. Uh, Jackson shut down the second U.S. bank for corruption, mm -hmm. and then you had a period where you only had the private banks who were blatantly issuing banknotes. I mean, it, they didn't say U.S. dollar or anything. They said <laughs> bank of whatever. So it was obviously a promissory note from the bank to, to come and get your gold, but they were issuing many more times many more notes than they had gold, and periodically, like once every six years on average, I read, um, you would have, they had banking crises. I mean, it was a very mm -hmm. stable system. They went through depression and, you know, wildcat banking and all that stuff. So then in the 19, 1860s, um, the, with the National Banking Act, the attempt was to get everybody into the federal system. They'd be national banks and they would be issued these notes that were, were national bank notes um, and they were supposed to be backed by government debt. And in order to get the the uh, state chartered banks to join the national system, they heavily tax their banknotes. So it's 10% tax on their banknotes. Wow. And some of the banks did join the national system, but some of them just got around that tax by um, instead of issuing banknotes when you took out a loan, they would just uh, give you a checkbook. And you would issue uh -huh. your own bank note, essentially. You know, it had the bank <laughs> sign on it. Sign it. You know, we, so, and that's so we. That's where why we still have a ten percent reserve requirement. It's it's the same thing. I mean, they're still issuing these paper notes. They yeah. know you have to cash them out more than about ten percent of the time, and so they only keep ten percent in reserve to pay yeah. you. With your yeah. notes. But now what they're paying is not even. You know, it's still just paper. Which is not, you know, necessarily a bad system. What's bad about it is, it would, I mean, it'd be fine if they were public banks and if the interest were going back to the public to yeah, be used for purposes. Yeah. If you cut out the middlemen and just had civil servants who were there to make prudent loans, that would work. And that's the whole point of the Public Banking Institute is we're trying yeah. to get a national public system set up. And ideally, headed by the Federal Reserve, we, I'd like to see the Federal Reserve nationalized because that is the deep pocket. That's where the liquidity comes from. And right now, all the liquidity is going into the big Wall Street banks. Yeah, um, that's for sure. Absolutely. We could be using it to back public, it, the public interest. And, and, and building infrastructure. I understand Canada abandoned printing its own money in 1976 to adopt a privatized uh, Federal Reserve System. Why did they do such a stupid thing as that? You know, borrowing money at prints and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, and gives to the private bankers. I know they don't give it, but they, you know, but, but why did Canada abandon their system so late in their, in their history? Well, they actually, from 1939 to uh, the mid-1970s, um, yeah, um, they, they actually, I think it was for 35 years, they were um, borrowing from their own central bank, which would create the money. And this worked very well. They, they did all sorts of infrastructure. They, that's when they started their national public health system. Yeah. Uh. And, you know, funded it very well then. I mean, it's got problems now because they have a heavy, heavy government debt because they quit doing that system. So in the 1970s, they joined the, um, the Basel Committee, which is part of the Bank for International Settlements. Mm -hmm. and, and Switzerland. The Basel Committee was supposedly, the, at that time there was stagflation and they blamed it on governments printing their own money. But... That wasn't it. Canada had been doing this for 35 years. They did not have inflation, and it worked out very well. The reason we had stagflation, the number one reason, was that we had taken, or Nixon had taken the dollar off the gold standard. The dollar had plummeted, and then to save the dollar, this is according to Bill Eng William Engdahl in one of his books, yeah. um, that uh, 
that Nixon and uh, Henry Kissinger had gone had made a deal with the OPEC countries that um, we will quadruple the price of oil and uh, in return so you will become very rich but in return you will put your oil dollars only in US or London banks you know only in Wall mm -hmm. Street or the city of London and uh, and then we will protect you militarily that was the deal so all of a sudden and then we had this little war the nine days war whatever it was and sure enough the price of oil was quadrupled and all these countries that thought they had enough dollar reserves but didn't have their own sources of oil they had to borrow so they borrowed from the wall street and london banks etc went into debt to the wall street and london banks and um, and so that drove costs way up everybody had to pay four times as much for their gas yeah. Then there was uh, the fact that at that time we had very strong unions. I mean, everybody was trying to raise the prices because they wanted more money. So, you know, there were all these um, factors driving, driving up the price. And then there was the fact that Nixon actually anticipated that, that we would have inflation in the 1960s because of the Vietnam War. And so the theory then was that you could prevent inflation by... Um, raising interest rates but what which he did or you know his uh, his the uh, chair of the central bank did but what actually happens when you raise interest rates is you drive up everybody's costs and so naturally they have to raise their prices to cover their costs so there were all these different factors driving up costs and it was blamed on governments printing money but governments were not printing money and certainly not anymore in the in the 60s or 70s than they had been in the 30s and 40s. In fact, mm -hmm. they're more in the 30s and 40s. So wow. But ever oh, since, it, go ahead. This, ever since there's this thing that banks are supposed to be, or the central banks are supposed to be independent from their governments. Uh, I mean, that was the whole Basel Committee thing that the goal, the role of the central bank is to maintain the stability of the currency at all costs, basically. So now our Fed is always aiming at their target interest rate of 2% for the Fed funds rate or whatever they're aiming at, which is why they've gotten it. Well, I won't go into it, but anyway, it's just this, it's not we, a viable. We need, we, we need to buy your books. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. That's why I keep writing. There's so much more to be said. You know, it's just so. My first book is called Web of Debt, but it is a web. You know, you just get in yeah, there. Oh, absolutely. More. Yeah, it is, yeah. And spider webs are sticky. Hey, listen, socialist countries like China, Cuba, and North Korea have nationalized banking systems. They meant their own money, and it is used by people owned banks. Are there other countries that have nationalized banking systems or are all others beholden to private bankers? Well, um, I think quite, I mean, China does have private banks now. I know that in the in uh, 2010, when they basically saved the global economy, 80 percent of their banks were government owned. And I, th I saw somewhere now it's down to about 50 percent. But even so, they're owning the 50 percent, you know, the important 50 percent. They own the big development banks. And so when they want to build a high speed rail, they just issue the money. You know, like any bank does, they issue it as credit mm -hmm. and then the proceeds from whatever they built, like fees for a railroad, pay back the loan. And that's the way it should work. And that's what happened during um, the Great, Great Depression, for example, with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, where um, it was a Roosevelt entity. I mean, it had been started by Hoover before him, but he Roosevelt vastly expanded it because he couldn't get the Federal Reserve to go along with this plan to have 12 industrial banks so it actually lend to industry. So the Reconstruction Finance Corporation lent to any sort of what were called uh, self-funding loans, you know, any kind of loan that would pay back, like farms or anything productive that where the proceeds of the thing you built could pay back the loan. So it's just a sort of a not risky loan. And in the course of that, they did that for 25 years, including World War II. So they funded World War II, rebuilt the whole country, and turned a profit for the government at the, in the end. And they started out with some modest amount, I think 500 million or something for capitalization. So 
it was a man to be in in the end it was like the largest financial institution in the world and that's i'm sure that's why they shut it down because the wall street couldn't stand the competition yeah 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 absolutely uh to clarify um my understanding is is that well i you know living there i mean you you don't see bank of america and bank of uh you know uh a chase what they may have is a service a service office they can do they can our hsbc they can handle people's accounts and stuff but they but they can't loan money and the um so they're basically sort of like a certain, you know, a branch, you know, to service, you know, bank accounts like in Hong Kong, et cetera. The the big the banks in China are um, uh, state owned. What they but they are on the stock market, and so you can the China allows 80, uh, 20 percent of its uh, uh, state owned enterprises to be sold or to be to sell shares. Uh, on the uh, on, on the stock market. So yeah, Bank of China. I can go buy. I can go buy stock in Bank of China, but they but they cap it at eighty percent. So um, I if you have if you have any numbers where it's fifty percent, I'd like to see that. But uh, they are they are they are they do have stock ownership, but they do cap it at uh, at eighty. At my understanding is eighty percent. So they are predominantly they're predominantly um, uh, people owned. And that that brings us up to uh, so if you, it, so go ahead. I didn't really answer your question. So, go ahead. Um, th there were many countries that were that oh. were not part of the Bank for International Settlements, and they're pretty much the ones we've gone after, like Venezuela, Iraq, uh -huh. Iran, Syria. Uh, well, there are others. That are, they're not popping into my head, but. You, well, but China, China, they're going after their oh, tank yeah. in China. Yeah. yeah, well, and China is a member of the Bank for International Settlements, but their banking laws, China's banking laws, say that that the central bank works for the government, basically, yeah. whereas yeah. ours say, say that they're independent. Japan's banking law says that the Bank of Japan will work with the Ministry of Finance, which I think is what we should do. In other words, the, ministry, the, the prime minister can say, I want to build X and I'm going to issue bonds for it. And I want you, the central bank, to buy the bonds. And they make a deal ahead of time. So now the Bank of Japan has bought up 50% of the federal debt of Japan. And it's not only not inflationary, which would be the big objection, but they can't even, they're still at 1%. They can't even get their inflation rate up to 2% where they're, what they're aiming for. And Libya, of course, is a great example, and that was one we had to take out. Libya was issuing money directly through their central bank, and they had a ton of gold, which... Yeah, 200 yeah, tons that disappeared. Yeah. Unbelievable. And they were uh, trying... Go ahead. And what? They were trying to uh, mobilize the whole continent yeah. into, you know, a different currency to get it out of being subject to dominance by the dollar and so yeah they wanted to create a gold-backed uh, african dinar that's yeah. what i read yeah yeah so you do that kind of stuff and you get your head cut off um tell us about the united states's only public bank in north dakota how does it work who are its customers and how does it relate to private banks in the state uh, it was founded in 1919 by a populist movement when the farmers were losing their farms to out-of-state bankers. Of course, North Dakota is a very conservative state, so they were. These were. There's a movie about it, docu documentary. But there's a documentary and there's a, a Hollywood movie. So these were Swedish and uh, Norwegian farmers that weren't going to have. They barely spoke English. weren't going to have anything to do with the socialist movement, but then. The name was changed to the Nonpartisan League, and they realized that they were losing their farms unfairly. It was a it was a Rockefeller cartel. So the railroad and the bank and the um, the granary were all one cartel, and the granary wasn't taking their grain inappropriately. It was good grain, and so they were losing their farms. So they banded together, formed this bank in 1919, and. Um, according to the charter all of the state's revenues were to be deposited into the bank and that's still the way it is so they have a huge deposit base they have 
there was an article in the Wall Street Journal in 2014 that said the Bank of North Dakota was more profitable than Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase. So they had wow. like eight percent return on equity, which is amazing. But the, their secret is they cut out all the middlemen. They've got a, 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 a captive deposit base in the state itself. They don't have to. Um, they don't have to advertise for depositors. They don't have to advertise for borrowers because they. It also says in their charter that they will not compete with the local banks, that they partner with the local banks. So they're really sort of a banker's bank. And the lo it's the local bank that will take the deposits and okay. find the loans. And then if they need help with the loan, like they need more liquidity, <coughs> then they'll go to the Bank of North Dakota to, um, you know, and seek help. Wow. And then the bank will buy down a portion of the, like the, the Bank of North Dakota might take 90% of the loan, but the but the original originating bank gets to keep the client. They get to service the the loan. Oh. You know, the client doesn't walk Wall Street somewhere. So let's say you had a big some sort of local development that you couldn't afford to fund yourself. I mean the bank that was too big for the local bank. They would go to the Bank of North Dakota and and get help on the loan. So they're there to help the local banks and the local banks considered them partners. They. Um, you know, the banking, whatever it's called, their organization endorses the Bank of North Dakota. So. Wow, that's interesting. So it's almost like sort of like a mini central bank. Yeah, that's what uh, they say. They say they're yeah, like, a, like a mini central bank in North Dakota. Well, maybe if my wife and I retire, I mean, my, my wife hates cold weather, but I was going <laughs> to... I was going to joke if we re, if we if we ever retire and I got to go to North Dakota and spend some of my money. They deserve it. I'm impressed. Well, listen. Speaking of North Dakota, as PBI campaigns for people-owned banks, doesn't the private banking gang do everything to crush any possibility, especially using their limit limitless wealth for sunshine bribery? Uh, maybe that's what happened with Jerry Brown. What's it going to take? Another even worse 2008 meltdown? Even one of the U.S.'s most powerful and popular leaders, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, wrote in personal letters that he could not proverbially pass gas without first clearing it with, with Wall Street. I mean, other than like, you know, China, where, it's, you know, where they had a socialist revolution and nationalized all the banks, is there is there a is there a middle road? I mean, how do you def defang the immense power of the private bankers have over the system while maintaining Western capitalism and hopefully having public banking? What what do you see as a solution? Well, hopefully, in two thousand eight, they actually considered nationalizing the the bankrupt banks. You know, the big Wall Street banks. So we're not talking about sudden nationalization of the whole country. But say Citibank was bankrupt and what they could have done was step in and, and it had been done before with, uh, well, one, I forget the name of it, but there was a big bank like 10 years earlier that had been taken over and nationalized for a number of years. But what they meant by nationalized then was that they took it over, cleaned it up and then gave it back to the private shareholders. But what I think they should do is nationalize it for good. Yeah. And, and then we would have some public banks, like just like China does, and use it for public purposes, use it for infrastructure and all those things. And meanwhile, if we have a grassroots movement, which we have right now, if you if you got a lot of local public banks set up, between those two, if you had some big Wall Street banks that can handle big amounts of liquidity and Ideally, I think we should nationalize the Federal Reserve. And there's so much sentiment now against the central banks globally. I mean, we're seeing them do outrageous things like the Central Bank of Switzerland is buying up stock on the stock market. The Bank of Japan is buying ETF exchange traded funds. So they're using this power to create money for things that, you know, sound unconstitutional at best. So if we could commandeer that power of the Federal Reserve, we could buy uh, Amazon or uh, oil companies or, you know, mm -hmm. different big companies that really should have been nationalized. Or in California, we have this problem of um, Southern California, or no, um, PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, which is now bankrupt because all these people are suing them for their houses that have burned down. 
And so the stock is worth almost nothing. So God. The state could go in and buy it. But the problem is the reason they don't want to do it is they'll be assuming the liability for all those lawsuits. But what they they should have done that earlier, you know, when the reason that the infrastructure was no good was that the private investors don't care about the long term health of the company. They're looking or of the people. They're looking at their short term profits. That's all they really yeah, care. about. Yeah, so we could, you know, with the deep pocket of the Fed. The government could step in and buy PG&E and pay off. All, they should pay off all those poor people that lost their homes. I mean, that's pretty pathetic. Can't You can't think of anything more traumatic. Than, yeah. You know. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, let's look at the future. There's a, there's a lot of talk in the news about a global meltdown, even worse than 2008, maybe more like 1929. Uh, one sign is the Fed's recent repo behavior. I, you know, I know you wrote an article about it, and I don't really quite understand it. Stand it, please, please tell us about uh, uh, this shenanigan that the Feds are doing. Yeah, the repo market is really obscure. I, I wrote about it in my latest book, Banking on the People. It's that uh, it used to be that the banks. Well, you know, banks don't really have the money that they lend. You you never go to the bank. The Bank of England finally acknowledged that in 2014. They came out with an advisory or a part of their quarterly report that said, contrary to popular belief, banks don't lend their deposits. They actually create deposits when they make loans. And in fact, that's where 97% of the money supply comes from. So that's, but in order to, so that means they're just creating this money in their books. But when somebody comes for the money, they have to borrow it somewhere. So theoretically, they've lent up like 80% or 90% of their deposits. So where do they get the money? When you come to the bank to take your money out, they never say, sorry, we lent it to your neighbor. Come back in 30 years. <laughs> they always have it. So where do they get it? They borrow it. And that's the, that's the magic of banking, that you can always get cheap money. Yeah. So they money borrow- money for free. Yeah. <laughs> so Go they, ahead. Used, they used to borrow it for, on the Fed funds market from each other. But after 2008, they didn't trust each other. And that that market froze up. And so the repo market is where it's called repossession or uh, repurchase. So repo Repur- is yeah. repossession. It's repurchase. repurchase. It's sale and repurchase. So technically you have sold a security overnight and then you t- and then, but the deal is you'll buy it back in the morning and that's how it works so there's this pawn you know it's a form of insurance it's like the it's like deposit insurance for the big investors who have more than $250,000 so so they feel more secure with this repo market and so that's where the banks lend now and that's where they borrow and that's where they get their liquidity but still the deal was supposed to be that the big banks would put their money into the repo market and you know so it'd be there the liquidity be there but jp morgan which is the biggest has the biggest uh, you know big chunk of deposits in the whole country decided to pull out now i've forgotten the number but it was 136 billion dollars or something and you buy back their own stock because their their um business model is profit at any any, you know, whatever is most profitable. And that was the most profitable for their shareholders. Absolutely. That's yeah. absolutely. But then so, that, go ahead. That meant the liquidity was not there for uh, the other banks. And and so, um, the, so the Federal Reserve steps in and just creates the liquidity and lends it to, overnight instead of instead of J.P. Morgan. So these, in, and that included like hedge funds and entities that really should not be able to borrow from the feds. You know, they're not in the Federal Reserve Act. They're not allowed to go to the feds loan lending window and borrow. But these entities can go to the repo market and the Federal Reserve steps in as they always do because they're trying to present, preserve that 2% target interest rate which is stupid it's um, i mean i shouldn't be critical but it seems to me that it's just not working i mean it's not the way to regulate a an economy and all these big investors know that the fed will step in and so they don't worry they don't have the money but yeah. they know they get it because the repo market will always be there because the fed will always 
you know, prop it up. Print, well, basically print money and pump it in. Yeah. Quantitative, what is that called? Quantitative, uh, what is that called? Quantitative easing. Yeah, uh, easing, yeah. Say, not really quantitative easing. Okay, it's, well. It, they're, see, they're lending it overnight, and then they take it back the next day. So it's just a loan. But here's the thing. All these great big, into, these big hedge funds and, of course, the banks can borrow for almost nothing, whereas the rest of us have to borrow on our credit cards at 17%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. Well, uh, everybody, duck, duck for cover. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Ellen, what are your current and future projects? You're quite a lady. I mean, we've been in contact with each other for the last couple of three months trying to trying to set up this interview and you're traveling and you're you're giving presentations all over the place and you're, you're you have a pretty amazing uh, mission and, and and career uh, trying trying to do well for the human race. So what are your current and future projects? Well, in the last 10 weeks, I did uh, four, well, let's see, 10 PowerPoints, three in-person interviews, <laughs> one meeting with, uh, leg or with local officials in seven cities. So <laughs> wow. that's, that's not a pace I want to keep up. But anyway, public banking is definitely in, in high demand right now, although the, they weren't all about public banking, but for the most part. So, and it's pretty interesting. One was in Korea where I learned a lot. And I, you know, it was, I'd never been to Korea before, so that was cool. It's always those things where, as I'm preparing for it, I think, that's it, I'm not doing any more of these trips. And then you get there and it's really good and you say, oh, this is great, I, you know, should do more of these. Anyway, so I would like to get back to writing, which is really my, what I do best and what I'm most trained in. And I, I mean, I really like to peer behind the curtain and figure out what's really going on and try to write it up in a way that people understand it. But meanwhile, the Public Banking Institute is planning a big national campaign this coming year because obviously public banking is, you know, it seems to be breaking out into the media and we want to use that opportunity to, to get the idea out there to more people. So we have many things going on at once. I mean, being an administrator of a, of a nonprofit is not really my number one favorite thing to do, but it needs to be done. And so those are all the things on my plate at the moment. Well, I wish you the best of success because, you know, I, you know, I have like, you know, libertarian friends emailing me articles that, oh, there's five banks that are going to collapse in China. No, they're not. <laughs> they're, no. Owned by the, they're owned by the people. They'll just take the assets and redistribute them. You know, it's just like, you know, it's just, you know, it's such a beautiful and elegant and simple idea and, and and i hope you catch on fire and uh and uh and i wish you the best of success if you ever get into asia you know or you know Chiang, Chiang mai hong kong china uh whatever um uh, in fact i'm gonna go uh meet some people in beijing um later this month uh, and i'll recommend that you they invite you you know to uh to to, to come to come talk with them because um uh, you ha you have such a powerful story, and it could save humanity, as far as I'm concerned. So I wish you the best of luck. Oh, thank you. That's great. I'd love to hear more about. Um, I, I mean, I've written that, and I believe that's true. That the Chinese banks can't go bankrupt. I mean, they're not they going to bankrupt. They're, they're not regulators. Why should they put their own banks into bankruptcy? Yeah, they, yeah. They just put the so in non-performing loans. You need some extra money in the economy, and that's how they get it out there. That's yeah. how they prevent. The booms and busts that we go through is yeah. you know, a little well, extra money in the form of non-performing loans. Listen, since 1949, all through the Mao era, they you know they they weren't rich, but they they did just fine. Then they so from the 80s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, you know they 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 just they they go from strength to strength, and and I. And they built infrastructure, and they science and research and development, and and you know education and and they've nationalized their health care and and now now they have health you know nationalized uh, 1.4 billion chinese have 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 nationalized health care they're now rolling in uh, a retirement program you know for the retirees and i i honestly believe that it's because 
it's on the backbone of people own banks and because otherwise they couldn't do it. So, uh, you really, really have a powerful story and, and we need it as, 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 as the human race. So I wish you the best of success and I will blast this out to the world and, um, and uh, keep following you. And, um, uh, you can email me and tell me what your favorite book, what is your favorite book that you wrote? And I'll buy it. Web of debt. <laughs> okay, web of debt. Okay, I'll I'll buy web of debt and uh, and and read it and uh, and maybe and then what I could do is I can invite you back on and we can talk about your book. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Jeff, and good luck to you too. You're doing groundbreaking work yourself. Okay, thank you so much. I'll let you know when this is up so you can share it uh, share it uh, with uh, in your circles. Okay. Okay. Great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.